What's going on, everybody? We're here. We're live. Welcome to a brand new Poker Live podcast. My name is Joey Grimone, a.k.a. Chicago. Joey, join today, guys. We got a very special uh, special guest today. We got I, I don't know if I can quite call him this officially, but I want to just say that he the creator, the godfather of online poker. I don't know if we can officially give him give him that title. We're going to find out here in the uh, air during the podcast. But we're joined by a young man who found the first ever real money poker site. Yes, the first ever online poker site back in the late 1990s, I believe 1997, 1998. It's called Planet Poker. He's uh, He's been playing poker for a very long time uh, from Canada, was in the was in the Navy, played, uh, played poker the first time in Vegas when he was 21, according to Wikipedia. Obviously, everything on Wikipedia is very true. And um, just for a little, a little kind of a story to a quick story to tell you tell you about him. He rode a motorcycle, allegedly. That's what he says, and I got to hear the story to find out more about this. He rode a motorcycle from Vancouver to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I got to say, anyone that does that has to be one awesome, two fucking insane, and three enjoyable to talk to, man. So we're joined today on the podcast by Randy Bloomer. What's up, Randy? Welcome hey. to the Poker Life Podcast, man. Glad to be here. How's my audio? I'm not sure if this is uh, is coming through on your end. Okay. Nah, man, you sound great. You sound great today, Randy. Okay. Well, it's uh, happy to be here. Happy to help out any way I can. I, you know, a lot of this stuff is old news, and I don't know how much your listeners uh, want to hear about it. But uh, you know, I'm happy to talk. You got to just uh, give give me the option to ask a few questions along the way because uh, I can benefit from your knowledge too. You sound like you're the hardest working man in poker right now. Because uh, how how many of these things do you do in a season? Uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like I could be doing seven a week, but I don't, you know, you probably don't want to overwhelm people and stuff like that. So I usually do two to three, uh, most every week throughout the entire year. And then sometimes I'll, I'll take some time off when I'm traveling or when I'm, when I'm getting a little crazy with my life. But, but yeah, I think in terms of, uh, you know, maybe like the other guy, Doug Polk, I know that we talked about him the other day. I think Doug's working pretty hard at this too. And, and then, yeah, I've definitely been, uh, I stay on the grind pretty hard, I guess, with things. Okay. Uh, your your last episode, uh, William Kasuf, is that the guy? Is that how you pronounce his name? Oh yeah, William Kasuf. He uh, he caused quite a stir in uh, World Series of Poker as far as uh, all the banter, all the discussion. I just uh, uh, wonder what you thought of all that, and uh, um, good or bad for poker uh, from your perspective. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, this is the second time I had him on. I love talking to him. He's, he's just super. Obviously, he talks a million miles an hour. Kind of makes my job you know, kind of easy in a way, but it, it's fun talking with them. I think he's great for poker. And this is something we talked about yesterday a bunch, which is, you know, the, the trend in poker these past couple of years has been a lot of these quiet guys, a lot of these guys that don't say much. And someone like him, you know, he's on ESPN. He's, he's talking all these lines. He's saying all these things. I feel like that's really good for poker because you have a character that you might love or you might hate, but either way, you're paying attention. And I think a lot of people out there realize, like, see him and they say, hey, I can be like that guy. I can I can beat that guy, or I can play like that guy, and I think it's good. I mean, from yourself, from your own perspective, what do you think about somebody like like a William uh, Kasuf for poker? They're really cracking down on the conversation that's allowed at the tables in Vegas these days. And uh, uh, if it's a multi-way pot, uh, no conversation. Uh, different card rooms are treating exposing your whole cards when you're trying for a read on the river when it's a heads-up situation. Some allow it. Some will kill your hand. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's not a consistency in how it's being dealt with across the, the card rooms here, but, uh, it is, you know, it, poker shouldn't be boring and it, uh, for the entertainment value, I understand it. Uh, at some point, what drives me crazy is it comes off the rails where, uh, um, if you're in a big buy-in tournament and this guy's yapping for minutes on every decision, <laughs> Instead of getting your 30 hands in an hour and the blinds are going up every 30, 60 minutes, you know, you're, you're getting half that because he's talking all the time. And that's a huge disadvantage as a skill player to not get the hands in that you need to generate enough opportunities to stack up some chips. Yeah, it was definitely one thing I asked him about yesterday. I said, hey, are you are you like talking every hand, every situation? Are you doing this all the time? And he said, you know, Basically, try. I mean, talk, tries to talk what only during hands that he's in, but he's still talking outside of that. But you know, also the tanking thing, I believe, was one thing that was brought up during the telecast as well. 
And, and yeah, I got to imagine. I haven't played with him. I don't really know if he's like that all the time, if he takes a long time all the time. But it's got to be frustrating, as you mentioned, to be in a hand with someone who talks for 45 seconds on each decision. And that way you at the table see less hands over that same time period of, of an hour. Yeah, a lot of the people that uh, in the past that came to poker came to poker because of televised poker and the Chris Moneymaker story. And uh, before then, it was limit poker was being played in the cash games and no limit was a tournament sort of venue. And there was, you know, a good game as a fast game. And when you're just firing bullets and you're shooting, that's that's how you want to play poker, it makes it enjoyable. And I think um, the trend over the last, I'm going to say, five or six years from my perspective has gotten much better. It's not all this Hollywooding, not all this coffee housing. The game is played at a reasonable pace. So you're, you're getting hands per hour and uh, makes the game more enjoyable. So fast is good. I don't mind the talking. I don't mind the, the extra level of uh, intensity when a guy is staring you down for key decisions, but I don't want to see a, three minute uh, scratch your head discussion over a pre-flop decision. It's just like making you crazy. <laughs> yeah. I know the tournament players, they love, they love taking their time on decisions pre-flop. I don't know what they're thinking about Randy, but they, they love just sitting there and, and thinking about something. I don't know what they're thinking about, man. I, I can't figure yeah, it out. It, recognizing there's value in them getting FaceTime when the camera's rolling, but this is, this is uh, I'm playing the one, three game and there's still the occasional, pre-flop decision that's like what the heck come on let's move along here <laughs> you're gonna raise you're gonna fold and then when when the guy's got a clear fold on a river bet that he's he was bluffing he got caught the guy reshoved or reshipped throw your hand in the muck and i think that's that that went out uh, that played out fairly well in the final of the world series of poker uh this year for sure because the speed of play was there they didn't sit on ceremony after there was a clear fold and they got hand, caught with their hand in the cookie jar. It was move on, let's play the next hand. Yeah. And so for live poker to, to stream that many hands in, in the uh, time frame uh, was a big plus because back when you were talking Sammy Farha and uh, these other characters, there'd be the long discussion. One way or the other, they were going to get some FaceTime and, and be on TV when there was oh, yeah. a some, clear. Some of my favorite hands are those high-stakes poker hands with uh, yeah. Sammy Farha, Patrick Antonius. They're all in for $900,000. What What do you have? What do you have? You like to have the cigarette just hanging out of the guy's mouth. And yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, that was classic and it was great for poker at the time too. It introduced a lot of people. But uh, it, it brought some people to the table that uh, encouraged bad behavior or slow play, I guess. Hmm. You know. So, Randy, some people might say, because we, you know, we kind of really haven't gotten to your, your backstory, your story. Obviously, you've been playing poker for a long time. According to Wikipedia, I love Wikipedia, man. I, I wish more people had Wikipedia for the guests I have on. But I, I guess I know a lot more about uh, most people I have on because I've known them for a while. But you started playing poker. You came to Vegas. You're from Canada. You're from uh, Edmonton, correct? Yeah. Okay. Edmonton was born and raised, but I actually started playing poker uh, when I was on a bus for a hockey team in Europe. Uh, as a, I guess I was over there for uh, for grade six and seven. Um, we were playing thirty one with uh, Deutschmarks because my parents were teachers and we were on exchange for two years in Europe, and so they'd send me off to on a hockey tournament for the weekend or a baseball uh, a trip. On the, on the all-star team and I'd come back with more money than I left with, <laughs> which was a treat, but we, you know, we just gather around and figure out games to play on the bus for, for Deutschmarks, which were the equivalent of 25 cents or something, you know, but, uh, that, that was the start of, of my sort of gaming <laughs> bit by the gaming bug. And then, uh, we, we ran poker tournaments after I got back, we got introduced to the Hold'em tournament sort of phase when, um, when I was 21, my first visit to Vegas, and we played in the tournament. It was, uh, the MGM was Bally's back then. And so they still had High Lie in, in the old MGM. And uh, we just stayed down the street. We wandered over there and got lost in that casino and, and played poker in, in a couple of different environments. It used to be called Maxim's. It's the first hotel I stayed at in town. And it's changed names as, as, it, as did the MGM changed to Bally's. But um we uh were sort of bitten by poker but it was very recreational at the time i went off to join the navy and spent a dozen years in the navy and then 
once I got an early retirement. From there, I had to figure out what to do with myself. I had two young kids, and uh, they still needed to get fed. And uh, my wife was in. Start my wife was in business. Yeah. Well, my wife was in business at, at, at a wine store in Victoria, British Columbia, and that allowed me the uh, sort of flexibility to um, scratch my head for a couple of months and figure out what to do next. And what I wanted to do was just open up a card room in Victoria, a bricks and mortar style card room. And uh, they were running one that was it was really quite popular, but it was uh, uh, being run sort of unofficially as a as a nonprofit society. And when I went down to try and get a license, I ran into so much bureaucracy. I came back frustrated and said, "Oh, screw it, let's just do it online." <laughs> and then uh, I actually had a good uh, a friend that. Uh, that was in the Navy and he was involved in programming the uh, threat acquisition software for the frigate program at the time. And so my background was mechanical engineering and I don't know squat about programming or it's the electrical and computer engineering guys that have that kind of skill set. And so he came on board and started, uh, you know, putting together a, a package that uh, would identify what was needed. And he stumbled across a software product that was online at the time that ASF software had produced. And they were dealing cards, but they, they really didn't know what was required to do it uh, as a revenue you know, business um, official card room where you, you'd grab rake, you'd show uh, bet sizes, you'd uh, you know, structure the game the way it's being played in Vegas in, in the bricks and mortar casino. So we went from there. Uh, went down to Atlanta, picked up software, started in Costa Rica, went to Guatemala eventually because we had banking and connectivity issues. Um, ended up in Curacao in the Dutch Antilles with an official license, but that was over many years and and uh, a lot of stress and, and struggle to try and get it right and service the customer properly and under attack from multiple sources. And, uh, and on day one, it was, uh, you know, there was that there was an indication there was poker out there, but it was being played, you know, over a single hand was taking many days to play out because it was sort of, uh, you email me what you're doing and I'll, you know, there's a, there's a guy in the middle and he's figuring out, okay, these are the cards and you know, he's, he's the honest broker, I guess. And I never figured it out. It wasn't, it wasn't being done real time or on a, on a scale that made any sense that, that uh, you could actually generate uh, rake from. But uh, January 1, 1998, we kicked all the free play players out and we brought them back in and we told them, mail in your check because we didn't even have credit card uh, processing at the time. And uh, that's sort of the start of, of things coming together quickly and then other people jumping in the market and competing with uh, sometimes better product than we had. And then after a couple of years of banging our heads against the wall, we had to go on a development cycle and, and create our own. Um, software product and and that's a whole nother story and you know five million dollars later <laughs> and a couple of years in India and back and forth and 40 programmers in Victoria it uh, it got pretty challenging and stressful but uh, you know it was it was an interesting ride and something you know I'm proud to have participated at some level and uh, you know it's um, the legal aspect that uh, eventually forced us out was we were we were a small operator by the time UIGEA made it even more challenging to operate and uh, being a young having a young family didn't want to you know skirt the law too uh, you know too blatantly when when they clearly defined that this was no longer going to fly as far as a U.S. player base we could have continued to operate but really 85 percent of our player base was U.S. facing so. It was a challenge to continue if we were going to close the door to those players. Well, it's a very, very unique story for the podcast. I love it, man. It's crazy. So, a lot of things in there. You start gambling, playing, or gambling when you're in Europe as a foreign exchange student playing hockey. So, you start gambling there at what? We say grade six? Yeah, 12, 13 years old, but not not on a big scale, just a recreational, you know. Oh, well, yeah, I, can't, I don't think you're a professional, can't be a professional at grade six. I mean, maybe some people could be a professional at grade six. We, we were rolling dice. We were, we, we were working the card deck uh, on, <laughs> on the hockey trip. So, it's like, 
you know, everyone wanted to play and, <laughs> and uh, you know, some were making good decisions, some were making poor decisions, and eventually you could figure out that uh, there is an edge if you were, if you were making uh, better decisions than your opponents. And that, that's, that's really the key in poker, isn't it? Is, uh, you know, there's a skill level based game that not everyone's happy, um, you know, clicking on the, uh, on the uh, games of chance at the uh, slot machine, hmm. you know, with no real uh, reward for thinking through what you were doing. You just push the button. That's no fun. So the, the thinking player, the, the guy that, you know, that's, that's the beauty of poker. It gets so complicated and you can go down the rabbit hole so far that uh, you can, I, I'm, I'm a big student of the game and I've got about 50 poker books and I'm reading new material online. So from, from your perspective, if, uh, if a guy's giving me a Christmas present that I haven't yet cashed the check, do I go and see uh, Swing Poker or should I go see Mr. Phil Galfond and run it once or is there someone else? And I'll, I'll give you a bit of a backstory of my, my skill level so you're not sending me to the wrong wrong uh, outfit, but uh, you know, I'm playing one, three, one, two, occasionally two, five in town. Um, I, I study the game when I'm in Victoria because that's where I play online, but I, I'm entitled to spend six months less a day in Vegas where I've got a vacation home. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the live play. So I'm, I'm not in it to uh, anymore to uh, grind hours or 16 table it at, at one of my, uh, previous competitor sites. I, uh, I play a little online to hone my skills when I'm away and I come back and test the waters again in Vegas whenever I'm down here. And I, I love to put in five or six hours a day at the poker game and then go do something different. But uh, um, I, I can generate, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say um, 10 big blinds an hour playing one, two or one, three. I don't know if I can do that consistently at two five because I haven't spent all my time there. Mm. But I'd like uh, over time to get to the five ten game, I guess, and do the same. And from your experience and talking to all your your uh, guys, is ten big blinds an hour the ceiling, or is there twenty big blinds an hour in in hold them out there, or should I be making a move to uh, your passion, which is uh, I believe pot limit Omaha. Woo. Get me excited Ooh. over here now. Now you know I am the uh, I am the resident uh, Putnam and Omaha world drug dealer, so I, I deal that game around on a consistent basis to people, and I, I give them their first taste of what it feels like. But I mean, I think um, you know for live win rates, I'm not too familiar with what exactly is out there for a live one two two five. So I know some guys in the chat play a lot of live. Uh, Big D, Dan Yarger, guy I started playing online poker with back in. Uh, 2007 says two, 10 BB per 10 BB per hour is pretty good. I mean, that seems pretty good to me. I think people maybe judge in terms of, I'm not sure how they really gauge their live poker success, whether it's an hourly or whether it's in big blind per hundred. And uh, oh, I guess in that situation, it's probably, what is that, 40 an hour, something like that? So 10, oh, I'm sorry, 20. I think you might be 30. lucky to get 30 hands an hour. Yeah. And so the quotes that I'm hearing from vlogs from other live players is, 10 big blinds per hour uh, in a live environment. Now, you know, you're getting 100 hands an hour online at, in hold of maybe. I, I don't know if that's realistic anymore with the length of time, and I don't know how that translates to PLO either. You get 100 hands an hour in PLO or not? not at one table? Uh, yeah, online. Um, that's a good question. I've never looked at that stuff. And I, I mean, I've mass tabled PLO for, for a long time. I don't really do that anymore. It's not possible, but... But yeah, I never really looked at what the hands per hour was. So if I'd be 24 tabling in a in a good hour, I could get about 17 or 1800 hands an hour. So and that's obviously I'd be playing a little bit slower on those tables, which would bring down the uh, the hands per hour that table is getting. So, but I think with Zoom now, you can definitely get 100 hands per hour for sure at one table. I would I think so, but I'd have to I'd have to check some numbers on that. I I would imagine so. Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure you should be able to get like um maybe three. 300 hands an hour or a little bit less if you play uh if you play zoom so it's uh but i think for for you mentioned earlier what would be the best resource i think something like upswing poker is great for players to make sure their fundamentals are good their ranges are good and they have a good understanding i think a lot of the run at once videos are are it's just kind of harder to navigate 
it's harder to find out which content is going to be ideal or best for you. And um, yeah, that's, I guess that's kind of the trick. That's kind of that's kind of tough to. I'm sure a lot of people out there feel that same way. You know, where do they exactly go to to get better at at live poker? And I think a site like a Crush Live Poker has a lot of stuff on there as well that'll probably be helpful for people. So, right. I'm I'm a big fan of Ed Miller's books and. Uh, what red chip poker has has got a lot of good material for starters, but at some point, um, I think I lost my picture. I don't know if I'm still there. Oh, nope, we see you. Um, uh, so, so I would certainly send new players to uh, red chip and uh, get them to have a look there. It's, there's there's a lot of free material out there, and at some point, you know, I might have forty or fifty poker books, but probably ten of them is where I'd steer people that are asking serious questions and really want to get good at it because there is a lot of bad material out there too and I don't want to slam anyone but but it's just not as uh, it's not as sound anymore and there's a timeline on some of this material too because you know the, the strategy that Dan Harrington put out years ago in some of his tournament books was fabulous but I don't think tournaments are being played like that anymore <laughs> and the science has, has really come a long way since then such that uh, no, nothing meant to discourage you from starting with Dan Harrington, but I think the guys like uh, Doug and others have gone so far, so much farther that uh, you really have to have to understand where where they're going just to uh, you know have a chance anymore. I, I I played in a big poker tournament in London one time about ten years ago, and I was uh, I got over there, and I was. Uh, you know, it was a 10 hour time change and I was my first tournament. I won it right out of the gate. And then I played in the second one, which was a, it was 10 times the buy-in. So the first one was just a, a teaser event. And so I got involved and I, I got involved with one of these hand, hand and mobster guys that are quite noted poker professionals back then from the Grosvenor casino in the UK. And, uh, I had a big blind or a small blind, big blind battle, and I had pocket queens when I was a significant, you know, I chips on day two of a big event. And I just like, oh, queens, and I ran into kings, and he was going to fold those kings, and he just wouldn't let them go. <laughs> and I, I wrestled with that for so long. And now today's tournaments is they just want to get the chips in with pocket threes, you know, late in a tournament when they're, when they're, chip stack is getting low, that it's just hyper aggressive. And you, if you're not willing to gamble, I don't think you have no shot of winning anymore. And uh, the push fold tables just show how wide you're supposed to be just putting the pressure and putting the, the pedal down. And uh, I, I, do you feel got enough structure to it that you can, uh, you can skill your way through, or do you just have to accumulate chips and be very, very lucky to, to final table anything these days. Well, Randy, I gotta, I gotta tell you, and I'm happy I don't know the answer to this because I do not play tournaments. I've played maybe five tournaments in the past eight years, and I cannot be more happy and proud to say that I play the great game of Pot Lemon Omaha cash games. And um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. And honestly, I don't want to know the answer to that question, Randy. I'm not trying to play no. No home, home tournaments, man. I don't know about that, man. No home tournaments. Bingo, bingo, bingo. <laughs> it's where all the glory is, though, man. It's where all the it's where all the glory yeah. is. You 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 mainly. So you mentioned you obviously you live in Vegas for uh, as long as the Americans will let you stay in Vegas per year. And you obviously you it seems yeah. like you you love poker. It seems like you've you've like love playing poker as much uh, as you can. I lost about uh, ten seconds of your your uh, feed there. So can you repeat what you just said? Yeah, sure. I think there's more lag. You move the camera somewhere. I think we got a little bit more lag in this part of the house compared to the last part of the house. Oh, I'm I'm in the same seats. <laughs> I, uh, I'll try and adjust it here. We'll figure it out, man. This is how it happens sometimes here. But yeah, I was. Uh, what the hell did I say, man? I'm trying to. I try to. I'm trying to. I sometimes don't remember. Oh, you're, I you're talking Vegas and, and coming to Vegas. So. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I was basically saying like you. You obviously you really love playing poker, and you you still love playing poker, even though. I mean, you've been playing now for how long? Thirty, forty, fifty years, forty years, something like that. I've, I've certainly got way more time to devote to in, uh, enhancing my game, um, but. When I, when I get tired of poker, I go golfing. When I get tired of golfing, I go on a motorcycle trip. 
and uh, you know wait to uh, to reconvene with family that uh, you know to be a grandfather in the next five years at some time and still young enough to enjoy time with uh, young kids so I, I've uh, I've got lots to do but I there's not much that I do that I don't really enjoy anymore so you know I pinch myself I life is life is freaking great <laughs> <laughs> let's go back. So let's go back to the beginning of Planet Poker here. So it kind of, how did you come up with the name for Planet Poker back in uh, back in the nineties? I don't know. It was uh, y you. You start writing these URLs down, and I heard uh, Calvin Air talk about Bodog, and he didn't really know he was going to call it Bodog for forever. He had a dozen names in his his drawer, and he kept looking at them. <laughs> and Planet Poker just seemed to make sense, and then. Uh, we, we also had some casino products on the market and we tried the online bingo and consolidating them all together in the same room when we weren't software developers, but we could tie the software products together and, and try and create a larger entity. And it worked for a little while. We had, uh, um, you know, we just came up with brainstorming different names for it. Planet Poker seemed to be the one that had some, uh, had some life on a, the World Wide Web. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm not coming from a technical background and uh, I had a, an Apple computer that was not internet capable, but when I decided to put um, poker on the internet, I had to go buy a new machine because I didn't have one. I wasn't on the internet. I didn't know how to use email. And so it, it was quite a learning curve. And then uh, wandering with servers down to Costa Rica um, with the ASF software loaded on on the same trip that we met these guys for the first time. It was quite a leap of faith. And we we're doing this on a budget that was uh, was uh, very finite because I had a retirement package that paid a very modest uh, uh, amount, but I was also subsidized or paid out for about uh, 14, 16 months from the Navy. So my background was such that uh, no, I, was, I wasn't a businessman. I wasn't a programmer. I had some experience or uh, interest in poker, and I had some management experience from my time in the Navy. But everything else was, uh, you know, learning something new all the time. And, and the biggest thing that people ask is, well, you're facing these, uh, these issues on an ongoing basis. And my recollection is that um, you just had to keep making decisions. You could make bad decisions and fix them after the work, after you figured out they were wrong. But if you stopped making decisions, you were just dead in the water. So like <laughs> you were confronted with, what am I doing? What, you know, how is it, how are you going to solve this? What are you going to fix this? What do you have to do next? And figure out banking in, in Latin America countries. And they'd come under attack by the department of justice and, you're always one step ahead of, of a nightmare a problem that needed to be solved immediately. You had to get on a plane and go do something. And the other people came to the table way better equipped than, than um, our initial team was. And then they had a head start on us because they had their software development in-house that, that was up and running and had a better product. So we had to carry on and compete with a substandard product for a long time before we had our own. And by the time we caught up, um, a lot of the money that was should have been earmarked for, for marketing had been spent on the 40-man development team and, and the product development that would, came lately. And, you know, you start with, oh, all, all we need is limit hold'em, and that's how we started. And then said, well, now we want five different games and we want no limit variations. And then you want to throw tournaments in the mix and we ran the first tournament too but we we ran the tournament where we paused a table from a three six hold'em game and moved them all to a six twelve hold'em game <laughs> you know it's, and go over to the other table now and trying to control people on the internet while they're doing this it was it was pretty challenging and just having the communication technology to control and herd people out of one seat into another seat because you couldn't change the stakes while they remain seated at the same table it was like it's technically not possible with the software product that we had. So um, 
we had Russian hackers. We had a random number generator hack that the guy made off with 50 grand on us. And, and we recognized that the, our players were being cheated, but we didn't know how. So we, we tracked it, let it happen for a little while longer until the software development guys in Atlanta were convinced that there was a problem. And once we hit them over our head, then we'd shut them down. And we, we, uh, could reverse engineer what our players were disadvantaged by the hand history feature, which was all our own development. You know, no, we, we had to come up with uh, solutions for connectivity issues out of Curacao because uh, it's the entire bandwidth for the country. And back then the internet was a business tool and we had very good stable connections through the weekend when everyone had gone home from work, but Monday morning came around and, and we couldn't keep our players connected. So we'd have to come up, up with a solution of all in protection and limit that so they couldn't disadvantage and shot take where they didn't want to call a bet. They just sit out and time out or pull the plug <laughs> out of the uh, wall. And so, uh, you know, there, there's probably a hundred hours worth of stories to tell. And, and, and my, my memory isn't, uh, <laughs> Short memory is probably a good thing in this business because you just get beat up and you know, the shit would hit the fan on such a regular basis that uh, you don't want to you don't want to live in the past. And uh, but it, it was an exciting time and it was the wild west. You know, for the internet, dot com heyday didn't allow us to uh, program have programming talent uh, in North America without paying you know hundred dollar an hour salaries because everyone was employing programmers. So. We went on a little hiatus to uh, Chennai <laughs> in India for to uh, get a team assembled and they didn't have the horsepower to get the job done. So eventually we brought uh, Indian programmers back to Victoria and put them in the room with with our own team, assembled our own team and ramped up and developed the product. And over, over time, the product was very good, but then uh, UIGEA and, and the other competitors in the marketplace were significant. Um, of an important note was that uh, Roy Cook and Mike Carroll were on board and they were they were uh, champions for planet poker for many years and uh, Roy in particular was uh, the integrity monitor of the card room activity so if cheating was was uh, um, if there was a concern about cheating he would pour over hand histories then he would ask for development tools to track money flow track playing patterns plot track uh, playing partnerships within the card room so a lot of the questions back then when we were just getting started is as well how can you stop people from cheating mm. and within the poker community we understood that um, anyone operating an online card room in a very safe environment just because you've got a track record and a history and the, the, the food chain is there if you choose to to follow the breadcrumbs to identify if someone is behaving uh, or disadvantaging another customer so I've got very little time for the guys that just let cheating run rampant at absolute poker slash ultimate bet during that period. It's like, that's just bullshit. <laughs> and I've got very little time for someone like Howard who holds himself up as a, the professor and uh, doesn't know enough to protect player deposits. Um, you know, when, when they know they're going to come under duress from the department of justice at some point in time in the future. So integrity, was uh, was our brand and I think we treated people fairly and we did our utmost to maintain a, a level playing field for the customers and I've, I've still got a love affair with poker and uh, and uh, I hope to be around in those card rooms <laughs> for a long long time in the live environment now and enjoying uh, you know because it's a great game like you know it's got so much to offer and uh, you know, sometimes we get a black eye because we've got some some guys that don't uh, or they want to bend the rules or break them. But. Yes. So what? So from the full from full tilt thing, obviously you just talked about that a little bit. So from your standpoint, as someone who has operated 
and been behind the scenes on one of these sites, like what's kind of your understanding about what, like what went down with that? Cause I think, you know, we know a little bit about it, but I guess I don't really fully understand exactly what happened and why they didn't have this money sort of secure. It, it, for, from my understanding, they were dispersing money to all the shareholders that they didn't have enough to cover the float for player deposits. At the click of a button, they know what's, what their liabilities are at any given moment. If their software product has any legs or life or the back end is of any significance, it's just database mining and you say, hey, look up. Like I, I, I could, at uh, Planet, I could, uh, I could click a button 24 hours a day and it would tell me how much money was on deposit from a player perspective, how much was pending cash out money, how much was uh, pending deposit money, how much was we were on the hook for for potential uh, chargeback. And, you know, it got more competitive and recognizing that you had to start dealing with shadier and shadier operators once net teller and, and uh, what's the other one, PayPal, you know, was purchased by eBay, I guess, and they, they pulled the plug on gaming uh, servicing the gaming community, but recognizing that your chargeback rates are, are X, you're, or, you know, you're on the hook for a lot of this money. You, you need a war chest. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, at one point a bank in Curacao went down that was private, you know, it was a, a banking relationship that seemed sound and was recommended by business advisors. But all of a sudden, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars was uh, was tied up, and great. So you still needed to stand up and say, with your hand on your heart, to your players that no, you're okay. We're smart enough to recognize that this is the this is the number that's in the <laughs> in the engine <laughs> that is playing the game, and we we are standing by it. And a hundred percent of player deposits when we shut down got disperse back to the players that was it was beyond question and for full tilt i don't know what the, the bottom line was did it take a year and a half two and a half years for american players to get their money back did, and the third party had to come in and bail and that's just horseshit you know that's when uh, howard letter has got a new mustang 1967 Cobra or whatever, and he's driving around town and bought himself a five million or building himself a new home. Um, Howard, no, that's bullshit. <laughs> so I don't know how he makes out, and I, I recognize he's in a tough spot when when players are pinging on him and he shows up for a World Series of Poker event. But mm -hmm. you know, a guy that's built up the brand has told everyone he's the professor cannot say, Oh, I'm just not that smart a businessman to know that when a player's got money on deposit and is playing at your site that he, he doesn't have to stand stand by and make good on that. So wait a second. So you as the you have access twenty four hours a day, seven days a week to how much money you have, how much money needs to be paid out. So you know exactly where you stand so it wasn't the full tilt guys didn't they say they they didn't know this stuff they didn't work they they didn't have access to this they had no idea this was happening and it was what was well, the kind uh, of ray batar sort of thing in charge of it yeah and from the from the shareholder perspective you trickle down to the shareholder at the end of the day he could always call and ask but uh, you know, where is this money? Let's look at the bank statements. So, you know, maybe they don't, they don't need to do it on a 24 or a, on an hourly basis, like an operator that has his finger on the pulse, but someone trustworthy in their organization needs to be relied on to do that. And if Ray Batar is the guy that, uh, you know, is the guy that was responsible at the end of the day, um, it's an easy look up to say, hey, what's in the bank account? What do we owe our players? But they were also playing super deep high roller events and, and forwarding some of their shareholders money where it's just an electronic figure that goes in a box that all of a sudden allows that appears at the table and they get to play it. Well, we didn't do that. And uh, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't play with make believe money at planet. We played with real dollars. Initially we didn't want to give the player a, uh, 
a hundred dollars for a hundred dollar deposit because we were only getting ninety seven dollars for the processing. Eventually, competitive pressures pushed us to that point, and and that char or that charge rate uh, went up to eight, ten, twelve percent, and some shady operators uh, because of the chargeback risk, because of the heat on the Department of Justice, et cetera. So it, it just got more challenging to operate late in the day. Yeah, so Planet Poker, uh, you stopped serving American customers. I guess you stopped doing real money, and that was 2007, I think? Yeah, uh, you, may be, you may have a more accurate calendar date than I do because it's just a fog right now, and I'm not good at memorizing the dates. But, uh, yeah, we, we wanted to abide by the uh, spirit of the UIGEA, even if there was some misunderstanding on to exactly when we were and what – the rules were going to be going forward, but uh, yeah, we just moved to the sideline. Uh, went to a, a subscription-based play for fun site model. That um, you know, I'm surprised we're still up and running, but it's it's on its last legs. And uh, but uh, we just didn't want to we didn't want to fight the fight anymore at that point with the pending legal threat and the uh, the uh, the attack on player deposits was going to come at some point. That was, uh, you know, it was obvious. <laughs> Guess not to everybody. So, well, well, when, you, you when, know, you to, when you went to the per subscription model, like how, how did so how did that work? People would pay twenty dollars a month or something like that to play on the site. Ten, ten, ten bucks a month, and then players would run out of money and want to play in the high roller table. So we had some whales, like a casino model that. They can't redeem their chips for anything, but for them to play in the million dollar, two million dollar game, and and we had a, the the big one was Omaha High Low uh, Pot Limit <laughs> that they just love shooting it up at a super massive scale and and play. It's a sociable environment because we had a good chat feature online, but there's there's no cash value for the tokens that they buy, and if they get a couple million tokens every month. As part of a subscription, they can burn through that in a hurry and want to reload and still play with their friends. So we, we had some players that spent a lot of money to keep us afloat, and that was it was understood that you know some people are subsidizing the site way beyond the ten dollar a month sort of level, and um, it's unfortunate that many of our customers have passed away and our <laughs> and the revenue stream isn't what it was five years ago. But uh, it's it's a flawed business model from the perspective of money sites can give away the product that we need to charge for. And, and then we also can't generate uh, enough revenue to have any kind of marketing budget whatsoever. So uh, we did the transition. A lot of the players that love Planet Poker from a sociable, social recreational poker level stayed with us and played on and, and it's still up and running today under the name of Planet Poker and Skill Ride. Hmm. And acekicker.com was the software developer. But the software, um, although it it's, uh, hasn't been touched for many years, it's a super stable product and, and has serviced real money card rooms in the past. So it's available for license. But uh, people are in this gray area where... They don't want to bring on their own programming team to grab a product and run with it. And the liquidity of poker in the U.S. market is still a challenge when they go to state because you're just not getting that player pool that all comes to the card room in this, you know, on the 24-hour-a-day window and generate enough liquidity at all the games and limits and tournaments that are available to the guys like poker stars. Um, what do we have now in, in the U.S. market? Is it uh, New Jersey uh, and Nevada? New Jersey, or there... Nevada, and Delaware, I believe. Delaware. I don't know how big a market Delaware would be, but it's got to be tiny, eh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's pretty small. Yeah, and until we open up California and New York and, and Florida, you know, where the poker is really being played, um, and getting those players back in an online pooled environment, it won't, it won't get to be where it used to be if it if that ever happens. But um, 
people complain about how tough it is in the poker market today. When I'm in Vegas, there's so many more active tables and so much more poker than there was when I was 21, when I was 25, when I was, <laughs> it's still, you know, it, it may not be, um, the world shares of poker number, I don't believe has uh, gotten as big as when Jamie Gold won. And I'm not sure what year that was, but that's probably the peak. Is that, is that your perspective? I think so. I think that was the the peak number. I think it was 10,000 players. Maybe that was oh three four oh oh three oh four something like that. I can't I can't oh five. I can't really remember back or no oh three I believe was when Moneymaker won. So I think oh five may have been uh, Jamie Gold. Uh, Craig Bell in the chat says he was going to say how it was obvious to other poker sites at the time in regards to uh, in regards to the uh, the U.S. I believe seizing, uh, taking money or making it hard for those, the, the sites to get money out. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there a question there or did I miss it? Um, I think he said you were going to say something, but then I asked you about how it went to the subscription model. Well, um, we didn't want to come under attack. We didn't want to slip past that UIGEA date that was being published or bandied around. And we recognized we were to try and operate without the US facing customer, we'd just be 10 cents on the dollar as far as size. We'd lose all liquidity. We were having a tough time, even with it, even with an advertising budget, you know, approaching a hundred thousand dollars a month. Uh, we weren't keeping up with full tilt or poker stars and paradise had a better product that took over from us. The market share when we, had a real tough time staying online and they had beautiful software and I don't know what's happened to Paradise Poker subsequent to that. Party Poker is still a big player in the UK market, I understand, I would assume. Um, but I, I'm not that current about where they all ended up. One of the players that uh, that uh, came up with Planet had beautiful software was True Poker and it had all these avatars dancing, but you know, it was, it was really pretty slick stuff. But when the poker player wanted to go multi-table, that was no longer a product of every, I'm not sure what happened to true poker over the long haul, but you know, the, the, people had a different vision of how, how to build out the interface, what to do with it, how to make it efficient. And, uh, you know, back when I was starting, I would never have said, Oh yeah, we we're going to create a professional player base. That's going to want a 16 table this game <laughs> and similar sit and goes, you know, instant on gratification uh poker stars did very well doing you know pursuing the tournament model first and then backfilling and figuring out the cash game where where we didn't even want to go heads up no limit poker because people lose their money so quickly back then they, you know a guy would make a deposit and we'd subsidize him for his entire role that he he'd deposit we'd get 97 cents or 94 cents on the dollar for and he'd lose it in three hands. <laughs> there was your only shot is generating one, two, or three dollars a rate per per pot out of that. And so, from an operator's perspective, with the weakness of the the player base, going to no limit hold'em cash games just didn't really was was a tough one. But that's what TV did. It brought in uh, and players had never played limit hold'em. Back in the day, seven card stud was being played on the East Coast. Holden was being played, you know, on the West side, and it was all limit cash games. And so, uh, the real experienced guy maybe played five tournaments a year and no limit Holden. That's that's all that was available. And then all of a sudden, um, new players just jumping into no limit cash games <laughs> that didn't have a poker background. They would, that money would just move so quickly across the felt and into the cash out circle that it was it was a huge overhead when you had to go dollar for dollar on deposits. Sheesh. So a question I see in the chat, and this is what this is the question I I, uh, I want to know too. How much money does an online poker site make, in, man? How much is a plan of poker making in the early two thousands? Like what what how does so they make they make money from the rake? And I guess that's the, that's the way they make money, just from rake? Well, uh, in the very early days, I'll give you a January, February 1998 story where I'm up watching the game and 
my customers have burnt themselves out and they haven't mailed in checks. So there's no real automatic way of replenishing while they're online. It's the snail mail days uh, for moving the money. And I see three guys playing poker. Um, 10 o'clock at night and I'm going to bed. I've had enough. <laughs> and, this is sort of, and that's all we've got is this one game with three guys that are still up at, uh, at 10 o'clock at night, West Coast time. And uh, so I go to bed and get up the next day and they're still there. And one guy stuck a couple hundred, one guy stuck, you know, 75, and the other guy's about break even. But, you know, they, they start and there's $900 or whatever. 300's gone into the rake jar and the other two guys are stuck and <laughs> they're still battling. They just don't see it. And so the money would, in the shorthanded game like that, without the adjustment of, of reducing it or capping the rake at a dollar, would just go into the rake jar so fast and the players would go broke. But that was limit poker. Now, we, when you can generate 100 bucks a table and you've got 30 tables going and multiply that by 24 hours a day, you can figure out, hey, there's revenue a significant revenue stream here and then you say okay well what if we have a hundred tables you've got no more overhead you've got you know you, you might ex hire an extra couple of customer support people but yeah you can um, the bigger sites were easily doing a hundred thousand dollars a day and then dollars a day during the heyday but planet never got to be that level so you know we uh, we did well and we had uh, only toll booth in town for you know, a few months starting up and then we were second place for a long time. And then we were, you know, trickled down to third place and we've got a, several good years of, of run time out of the equation, but, uh, you know, can do very, very well. Um, but now you're seeing board advertising at the, uh, in Toronto and Montreal at the big hockey games. And so the, the budget for the, on the spend, must be approaching a million or two or three monthly just on uh, advertising budget that I'm seeing. So, you know, you can reverse engineer and figure out, okay, well, if they're spending that much on, on advertising, you know, they're doing many times that. Right. Well, I guess it's kind of crazy. I mean, poker stars sold for, for, I mean, I guess they, they probably sold overpaid, but they're sold for a couple billion dollars and, that's a space that, that you guys were kind of in first there. And I suppose that if some steps were taken, if some of the other things might have might have broke the other way, then that could have been a position that uh, that Planet Poker was in. Yeah, but w um, there had been many, many uh, things that occurred along the way that prevented us from, you know, running with that. But, but the, there were other market leaders along the way, like, you know, Party Poker was a good one that cashed out at the right time. Mm -hmm. But in... If you're comparing party poker dollars to um, dollars, you might be disappointed with that too. But how many hundred million do you need if you're going to go live on an island? <laughs> so that that's, hasn't been the case for us. But we're, you know, it's uh, was it a missed opportunity? I don't want to. I don't want to reverse engineer disappointment when I'm really quite when I pinch myself every day and I'm thinking I'm having the time of my life right now. So. Um, I'm, I'm not one to dwell on uh, on the past. Uh, the reality of the situation was we were in a we were in a tough fight against a lot of people that were way better funded than we were, and uh, you know we were we were setting a course where um, they got to benefit from some of the decision making process and some of the the, the business model that got proven along the way. Um, just made it easier for the guys that came second, third, fourth, fifth, and eventually, you know, mind share or market share. Um, we didn't, we didn't get charged. We didn't go to jail. Our customers got treated fairly. And uh, <laughs> overall, it's a pretty happy story. We didn't, we didn't get charged. We're not in jail. Well, well, well realistically, <laughs> Randy, nobody went to jail, really. I think maybe a couple of payment processor guys went to jail that were in Nevada, but None of the site, people running the site really went to jail. You know, uh, Calvin Ayer's done very well financially, but he doesn't want to land his, uh, you know, if he's flying from Costa Rica to Vancouver, he doesn't want to land in the States. Um, but 
you know, how big a threat is it? He's, he's not a nasty, mean um, person that's done anything horribly wrong. He was involved in a, in a business that, uh, you know, different countries had different policies about. So uh, from an ethical perspective, I don't, I, I sleep very well at night. That, but uh, raising a young family and looking, you know, having, having legal concerns you know, made the decision when it got to be a tough decision, mm -hmm. easier to go and say, hey, we'll just go down this path. We don't need to fight. Um, a, a lot of the operators at the time, we went to Kanawaki and the Mohawk Indian Reserve just out of Montreal. And lawyers that I consulted with said, hey, you can't go there. You can't do that. And so, you know, we made things, we made things tough on ourselves just to make sure that uh, we weren't under duress or or crossing any obvious legal barriers that uh, could come back and haunt us. So from that perspective, you know, uh, quite happy with the way it turned out that, you know, we, we sleep well. <laughs> we don't expect anyone knocking on our door causing us grief. So the Kawanaki thing you mentioned, and, and I think UB and AB, I got AP, I think they were based over there. Now, what's your uh, what's your view on that whole situation with with Ultimate Bet, with the super users, with I mean, I, I got I got to run the memory back in terms of what exactly was taking place with one of the sites. I think one was a super user site, the other one, I think that was super users too. One of the founders was playing on the site. I can't remember that guy, that older guy's name, but from what you saw, what's that? What's kind of your view on that? They, they have to be, you, you have to suggest or at least think that they are directly complicit in what went on because it becomes so obvious when you're running a card room and you can monitor hourly win rates amongst your player base with, with some basic software tools that uh, when there's a spike of that nature and um, he's you review any suspicious hand histories and you have any background in poker, you become very, it becomes very <laughs> obvious that <laughs> this shouldn't be happening. You know, how, how is he, uh, how can he be playing perfect poker? Perfect poker doesn't happen. You know, you, you, you let go some winners, you, uh, you make some bad calls, you, goes you know generally your your hand range against your opponent's hand range of your winning player is is going to paint you a profitable picture at the end of the series or end of end of a period but uh, you don't win them all but uh who was it that was the world series of poker champion that got his his banner taken down uh, uh, Russ, Russ hamilton i think his name was yeah, he profited enormously at a rate that just any awake operator would be aware of. And so they were either stealing directly or they were really too naive and, and not smart enough to <laughs> drive a car. All right. If you have guys that are playing the highest stakes, don't hold them cash games on your website, you think the founders are playing someone like Prelot Friedman was one of the most well-known players at the time. You think the people running the site would be like, okay, let's take a look at what's happening here. You're always watching your winner, and there's always going to be the the best player in the card room. You're gonna you're gonna be monitoring, and who is the best player in the card room? But you're gonna review that kind of activity month after month, and just say, hey, are, are we okay here? Are we okay sending this guy his cash out check? Is he uh, doing something he shouldn't be doing? Is there a trend? Is is there a pattern that we need to look at? And uh, you know, it it all falls within a a fairly consistent norm of okay well second place isn't that far behind and third place and then you've got a dozen players that are consistently good and sharp sharp uh, edge or advantage players they, they know what they're doing they know they're making good decisions but when you've got a spike and a guy that's so far out of the norm <laughs> pulling millions of dollars out of the site on a regular basis that just doesn't apply that's just too obvious and and your ten dollar an hour cash out uh, customer support representative would recognize that hey, this is kind of unusual for a player base of 
thousands of players that this guy is every three days asked for another big check, another big check, another big check. Whoa, 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 let's have a look. Let's look at his hands. Let's look at where the money came from. A lot of the concern uh, was that the money that was coming in was being funneled out, wasn't being played or competed for. It was just being transitioned and the site was on the hook for uh, the chargeback. So you needed to protect yourself from the business side of it on a cash out. So you would be looking at that hard if it was your money leaving. So why weren't they looking at when it was leaving the magic money box? <laughs> why, why weren't they looking at that on a close level on an ongoing basis when it became obvious that uh, it was a large sum of money? You know, Right. And then the site came back and people were still playing on the site and then people lost more money on the site when when Black Friday happened. I mean, it's it's crazy that kind of some of the things that were happening then that that scandal happens that the site still operates. People still play on there. Obviously, you couldn't the money the terms of trading money, you weren't getting much for your money, but. And they weren't giving cash. I mean, I don't know. What a fucked up, crazy time. I mean, like you couldn't get your money off the site. People were still playing on the site. I, it's it's. It's it, wild. The collusion became obvious uh, within a within a working partnership relationship. That was, but it had to be it had to be done so subtly. Otherwise, there's a spike and there's a trend, and you know, once you got greedy, it was an easy catch. But on a on an ability to see whole cards or have that you know ability to disadvantage your opponent. Um, so significantly that just has to stand out like a sore thumb. Um, so yeah, I've, I, I'd met some of the participants, had business discussions with some of those participants. I don't want to name them personally, but, uh, you know, I don't want to give them the time of day. I don't want to sit down with them and have that discussion. It's just because if if you are that stupid, I don't want to hang out with you. If you are that dishonest, <laughs> I don't want to hang out with you. So, can you, so uh, can, you uh, clar can you clarify that what you meant? Well, it's the, the people that were involved in the ultimate bet absolute poker component were were um, people that you'd see in the in the bricks and mortar space when there's a big tournament because we'd all be sending. We'd all be uh, graduating people from an online tournament to uh, the World Series of Poker main event back in its heyday, and you'd, you'd be in town at the same time, and you'd say hello, and you're on speaking terms, and you, you, you'd share war stories occasionally or have a beer, but uh, you know, after something like that happened, you just like, no, <laughs> I'm not going near them. I, I don't want anything to do with with uh, the or, or really left a bad taste in your mouth as far as jeopardizing something that that poker's a great game i'm i love the guys like mike sexton and mike caro and roy cook and they're you know they've been proponents of of this game and trying to grow it for a long long time and then when guys come along like uh russ <laughs> is it hamilton yeah and and there's there's a couple other names that come to mind but you just like how are they? Uh, I don't know how they live with themselves. So um, what, about, what about a guy like a Phil Helmuth, who was very highly active with a UB, very close to Russ Hamilton, seemed to be very close with the operators of the site. I understand and, he's a really nice guy because when I grew up, he was a real, he was the uh, poker brat. And uh, dealers at the area speak very highly of Phil Helmuth on a personal level. I don't know him personally. Um, being used as a marketing tool maybe he doesn't have the background and the the back end acumen of the operators to recognize that the bad stuff was happening i don't know if he deserves a free pass or not i think uh, some of the guys within full tilt um aren't probably should have different levels of responsibility compared to the principles that were just um out there lying to the public and how you break that down break it out i don't know uh you know does ferguson get a pass because he wasn't uh it wasn't 
greedy self-interest that he was stuffing money in his pocket. He was trying to make it work compared to uh, Bittar and, and Letterer. I don't know. I, I, I can't be the judge, jury, and executioner. I just know that, uh, you know, you guys fucked it up. <laughs> and it's, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but it's, uh, you, you got to take ownership of that. When, when you step in it and, and it's a self-inflicted wound, you know, don't tell me a story that, oh, geez, I'm just not that smart. I didn't know I shouldn't, shouldn't protect that, those player deposits for the players. Or I didn't know I shouldn't cheat my customers. <laughs> like, come on. You know, oh, we developed our software, our, our product, such that it didn't matter if you were the lead programmer or anyone. You could not uh, identify what those hole cards were until they were posted in the hand history at the conclusion of the hand. So it was it was in the magic box dealing cards, but no one knew what the outcome was going to be. And the random number generator was checked and rechecked after we had our initial foray into that bad experience. But, you know, it was maintaining the integrity of the game was uh, was the whole backbone of the business. And for guys to have pissed on that. Yeah, I think. Uh... Those guys obviously left a, a bad taste in many online poker players' mouths because when you have that experience happen to you, you're not very inclined to want to come back to play online poker, especially if you play on UB and then you play it on full tilt. I mean, I'm sure there's so many players out there who had experience with these sites and they got their money essentially taken. They might not have ever got it back. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty, um, it definitely had a very negative impact on the entire poker ecosystem, those experiences, those sites. Okay, 2016 is winding up. I don't know if you're doing another one of these tomorrow or uh, or, or not. But uh, what's the what's the good news poker story for 2016? What's the good news poker story for 2016? I was thinking about this because there's a thread on two plus two about um, about something related. So let's think about this. I know the chat's gonna have some ideas. You guys tell me. You guys pay a lot of attention to to news stuff. Um, is it? I mean, it can't be William Kasuf because I mean, I guess it could be. Um, I guess key win winning the World Series of Poker main event. I guess it's not that um, Kasuf. I mean, honestly, it feels like it's it's probably Kasuf. I just I think like he's the feel good story of 2016. Okay, I on the negative side, I don't think Don Trump getting into power with uh, uh, Sheldon Adelson being his prime promoter is going to do anything for online poker for the for the next four years. Is that uh, is that the general sense of of online poker's opportunity <laughs> or the next from at a federal level anyway it seems like from a federal level uh just in terms of adelson being on the transition team him being a part as you mentioned with trump i mean trump had one of his uh one of his speeches there one of his campaign things in uh in nevada it was at the casino so it doesn't look good on a federal level and on a state by state level, just from doing some research, it feels like some states are closer than others, but the big state, California, it doesn't look very likely in the very near future. So, so yeah, it's uh, not looking, not looking positive. I'm not too, I'm a pretty optimistic guy, but I'm not super op optimistic when it comes to that. Okay. And I saw something online that you're trying to, I, I don't know if you've got a, a challenge that you're you're uh, trying to accomplish personally, but are you trying to make 500 grand playing PLO in the next in a certain time period, or what's that about? So that that was a challenge I did on the shout out to Calvin Air. I know we might not own the site anymore, but shout out to Calvin Air for creating Bodog and Bavada. Uh, so that was a challenge I started last September, uh, and I, I was playing 1020 PLO, and I was trying to make uh, 500 thousand. So we're gonna find out if I continue doing the series. It's a lot of strategy. I'm still like unsure if I'm gonna keep doing it, but I know everyone out there loves it, so I'll probably keep doing it. But yeah, we're gonna find out. Can I? I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna see if I get there. Okay. Are are you? Uh, is there a timeline or is it open ended as far as this uh, this? Open ended. This is season. This is season one, Randy. Season two could it could be ongoing right now. Okay. I'm I'm gonna come up with the same. I'm gonna try and generate 150 bitcoins so I can trade in my old car and get a new one, uh, based on uh, on play in Vegas live play over the next 12 months. So I'm gonna bang away at those those guys in the 2-5 game starting January 1st and then hopefully move up to 5-10. 
but uh, I'm gonna go lean on uh, Mr. Doug Pokes of Swing Poker and, and uh, see what I can learn. So you have, you wanna get 150 Bitcoin and I think they're at a thousand right now, right? Uh, I, I'm not sure what the Canadian versus the US exchange rate, I think like 750 or 800 bucks is, uh, is a Bitcoin. U.S. dollars is that what kind of car you buying, man? Hmm? What kind of well, car? You I got an old. I've got a very old uh, Porsche 911, and they told me it wasn't worth very much, but it's 10 years old. So I figured, if I'm going to work hard at the poker game, I need to reward myself when, when yeah, when I get my 10 big blinds per uh, per hour at the 510 game. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get it at the one three game though. It might take a lot. I mean, yeah, it might take a lot of hours. I don't know. Has anyone heard? Anyone in the chat ever made a hundred thousand in a year at one three? I feel like they'd move up before that. No, I, my, my intention is to move to the two five game starting January first, and then hopefully evolve to the five ten game. But you know, five ten is there's a lot of regs in those games, and it's I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they're beatable for ten big blinds an hour. One way to one way to find out, right? And put the got to put the work in, put the time in. That's the plan. Um, what else, what, what, what else do you, do you like for, uh, like I've, I've seen, uh, I've been looking at verbal poker tells from Elwood. I've been looking at Will Tipton's, uh, expert heads up, no limit hold them, two, one two, one and two that, uh, you know, the Harrington book on the, uh, were really good back in the day, but they, they may be out of date. So I'm, I'm, uh. All right, for, for, for Tells, I'll give a shout out. I'll give a shout out to, to Blake. Blake Eastman, he's got a site called Beyond Tells. I would recommend Beyond checking that Tells. out. I know he works pretty hard at that. And uh, someone I've talked to a couple of times, asked, just we've uh, chatted a little bit about a couple of different things. And uh, yeah, man, I kind of like uh, I kind of like what they got going on over there. Site looks good. They're coming out with a, a, new, uh, a new type of, I'm not sure if it's a course or a product, but I know they got something new in the pipeline as well too. So I would check that out. Uh, I got I got a suggestion for you for a guest on your show. I don't know if you've even maybe he's been on the show already, but it's a guy I met a long time ago in London, and he's significantly immersed in poker and sportsbook betting. But he's an interesting guy online too, and it's uh, Neil Channing. I don't know if you know him. I, I do know. I, I've never met him before. I know that we um, we have mutual friends, mutual acquaintances. So I think yeah, that's a good. Po you would be pretty. Yeah, he, he can tell you. He's pretty plugged in as far as what's going on, on the other side of the pond. And I, I don't speak with Neil regularly, but I keep bumping into him when he's uh, in Vegas or if I'm on a card room in Europe. But uh, he, he's uh, he's definitely immersed in the uh, the degenerative culture of gaming, and and a lot a large part of that is sports book stuff that he's engaged into. But hmm. well, let's take a couple of questions from the chat, and then. Uh... Now, what do you got? What do you got planned here for 2016 New Year, 2017? You, you doing any poker traveling, or are you kind of staying in Vegas, going back home to, to Toronto, Edmonton? I've missed the World Series of Poker a couple of times, so I'm trying to balance my schedule so I don't eat up all of my uh, six months less a day period. 2017, so I hope to be back in. Uh, they just introduced the schedule. I think it's the end of May. Is yep. the start of WSOP games are normally good. Um, games tend to be really good on that weekend with the uh, the um, 64 uh, hoops teams, March Madness too. So th there's different spikes that occur in this town that automatically you say, "Hey, <laughs> these aren't the same grinders I'm facing," and this is a wonderful time to be in town. But uh, I'm hoping to come back for the World Series of Poker and, and do a month or, or so of cash game grinding. I may do some satellites and try and play into a tournament, but I, I'm not enormously tournaments can be profitable long term. It's just such a grind and there's so much variance. Mm -hmm. But what's, uh, here's a question for you. Bankroll size for, uh, for a Hold'em player versus bankroll size for a Pot Lemon Omaha player, is there an order of magnitude difference? Yeah, Does I mean, most, most people suggest you have a you have more buy-ins for PLO. I've sort of always approached it 
differently, especially if I was a winner. I mean, mainly online. I, I would shot take all the time because I always knew I could beat the lower stakes for a very good win rate. I'd always make it back. I mean, I probably did this unresponsibly about 150, 250 times in my Nolan Hold in my PLO career. So, but I think that um, in theory, <laughs> I don't want to recommend any bad bank management habits out there to people, but I mean, probably somewhere 50 to 100 before I moved up. And I would probably shot take if the game was a little bit good. If you're confident in your ability to make it back. And some people, if they take a big loss, that's going to fuck up their mindset so bad that they just can't handle shot taking. So for someone like that, I would want to have more buy-ins, but for someone who can handle it. Okay, I, I'm thinking of going in on the real shallow end at the Aria, and it's a one-two-five game, I believe, with a five hundred yeah, dollar yeah. buy-in. So if I'm taking that that approach, and I'm uh, like a large part of uh, my success is probably I'm, I can I can be patient, and as a almost a local, you don't need to try and book a win over, you know, a four day junket or something. You're not coming in here and just firing like crazy. So pot limit Omaha intro one, two, five baseline worst hand on the button that I play, you know, is it, is it, is it a positionally aware game that you just, you, you can get away with murder on the button, but you can't out of position. Yeah, it's very, especially the full ring live games. I think position matters a ton, especially if you're less experienced. You are going to be in a lot of spots out of position where you're going to be having a lot of weak ranges on the turn and the river, and you're just going to be absolutely have not much of an idea what to do. So, yeah, obviously in in, in PLO, the button is where you have your biggest win rate. And, um, and that's where, I mean, I, sure, it'd be great if you could play all your hands from the button cutoff, but unfortunately you can't at live PLO. But... I think for live PLO, I really recommend people just play pretty tight from early position, loosen up from the button, cut off hijack, pretty standard stuff, but people have a hard time doing it because they don't really know what tight is or what loose is. And I think the easiest way to kind of do that is there's a couple, I mean, I guess that one site's not very good, but I know Upswing, Upswing Poker is working on a PLO lab right now that'll be out soon. There are some good books like a PLO Quick Pro Manual that's a fucking amazing PLO book. But I think a lot of it just comes for you playing. You're just playing some hands, and ideally you want to play double-suited hands, high-card hands, hands that connect. And then as you go to late position, you can kind of go from there. Okay, so uh, you may have mentioned this, and it may have flown right past me. Best PLO book for a guy trying to transition from Hold'em to PLO just as the intro. What's the... What's the one that's going to open my eyes and not steer me steer me wrong? I got it here. I got it here somewhere. The, P, like the I got just got to give a shout out to my buddy Jean Beaupre. His book PLO Quick Pro Manual is so fuck. It's so good. It's just it's it's so good. It's literally like I I read it. I'm, I haven't I haven't really played too much poker. So I'm trying to focus more on uh, more on the hashtag entrepreneur life and working with people at poker. But I've read that book maybe three times in the past three months. Just I I just love reading it. I feel like it helps me sure up my fundamentals so much. And I really think, Randy, that people that have been playing poker for a long time, Nolan Holden, PLO, whatever, they they really neglect to read anymore. They think they, they, they're at a certain level. They think they know this. They think they know that. And you'd be amazed at what you really can learn going back and, and just reading some of these books. You might take something new away. It might remind you of a fundamental you've been struggling with, especially for break-even guys and, and losing players. I mean, like it's just such a, a thing that people don't do, and uh, I think they should be doing a lot more of it. Yeah, my my good uh, my good Holden books they get read three, four, or five times, and then I just recycle them because I got to go back and it, it, put a new one in the rotation. And if I if I feel strongly about it, it stays in the rotation. But I'm I'm often going back to the same book three, four times and just visiting it because I've forgotten what how good they are and what's in there right i mean i think poker it's it's such a hard game it really is hard to be amazing at poker it's hard to become one of the best players play the highest stakes be a consistent winner for many years but you have to realize that and you have to put that work in a lot of people you know they don't want to go back and read the read the book the second time they don't want to go back and read the book the third time they'd rather tell you how they're going to read a book the third time they'd rather tell you how they're going to start reading a book or they'd rather tell you how they're going to do all this shit that they never actually do 
And that's what I've really been finding is that a lot of people say, I'm trying to get better at poker. I want to get better at poker. I'm going to get better at poker. But they just they just don't want to, they don't want to put the effort in. They don't want to, they want to just get the money. They start complaining, like, why am I not winning? Well, you're not putting in the fucking effort. You're not putting in the work. You're not reading that book a third time. You're not going back and re shoring up your fundamentals. You're not you're not talking to other people about hands. You're just fucking complaining about poker hands. And I, I've I've just seen this so much. And I mean, it's it's it shows for someone like myself. It, it explains to me why I've had success at poker because I put in so much effort and work and so many hours. And so many people out there post on the forums and say, "My God, the rake's high. What am I gonna do?" It's like, man, go fucking put in some effort, man. So. I got a little fired up when I'm a little tangent there, Randy. But I mean, I get excited when you say, hey, I read, like, you're not, a, you're not a professional poker player, but you're still out there trying to better your game. Ask, look at, like, you're asking me questions right now. Like, it's, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, anyone could be asking me questions, uh, but you're actually here. You're asking me some questions. You're asking me some fucking really good questions, too. And I just got a lot of respect for that process. So that's I, I love the work. You know, it's, you know, the, the component of, of the enjoyment of poker is, Part of it's in the study and the and the learning and trying to discover new techniques and and staying current. It's not just about you know I, I get tired of grinding and just hammer hammer hammer. I I enjoy the time away from the table, time into the game because it's got a lot to offer. It's you know it's it's a wonderful battle. Um, I think the chess champions of these days are probably all in their twenties, late twenties, and me getting to be approaching 60, I might lose a step, <laughs> but uh, I hope to be doing it when I'm 82 and still, you know, not hemorrhaging money. But uh, keeping the, keeping the brain sharp is is uh, part of the exercise as well. How how else do you keep the brain sharp? What else What else do you like to do? Well, to clear the head, uh, the motorcycle is the way to go. It's like all of those thought processes that uh, are engaged you know, and the conversations that you're having in your head, if you're completely focused on the motorcycle ride and, and I'm not trying to do anything at breakneck crazy speeds. Um, I'm just enjoying the program mm -hmm. and that's, that's my yoga, I guess, or uh, meditation. And uh, yeah, the, the trip, uh, I've been on many trips, but the trip from, uh, that I started on my own went from Victoria in January and down to Buenos Aires was the first leg of the journey. Then I flew home and uh, shipped the bike to Australia and did, did a round of trip of Australia. And I was supposed to, with my buddy that I was traveling with there, was supposed to go to Korea and then make the trip across Russia to Europe. And my father got ill during that period and I had to bring my bike home and had to get home. So I missed that leg. So I'm, I'm looking at calendars and schedules and say, hey, when can I do Russia? And maybe this is a good time to do Russia that Vladimir and uh, Donald get along so well that I could actually sneak sneak across the border, make my way across Russia without any hardship. But uh, it's uh, <laughs> they're having a little difficulty right now expelling 35 diplomats today or yesterday or so, tomorrow. So what does is, what is your wife think about this when you're motorcycling from Canada to Argentina and then you go to Australia and you motorcycle around Australia? Um, she, she's done motorcycle trips with me and she's ridden her own bike in both South America for, uh, about three weeks. Uh, we went down to Tierra del Fuego from Midway, th um, s somewhere in the middle of Chile. And, uh, she's done a trip with me in China on her own bike. You know, these are tour guide tour bikes, but, uh, rode her own bike. We did Thailand and we started out doing Baja, but we had a little incident with the family doing a Baja <laughs> off-road adventure and that one didn't end as well as it should have, but it, it's, uh, she, she's a willing participant, but she's uh, more of a hiker too. So she's done a lot of hiking in Nepal and, uh, and uh, base camp of Everest and, and that kind of thing. And I don't like to walk, so I'd rather get on the bike and do it. So does base camp of Everest mean she climbed Mount Everest or I, I, I don't know specifically? Well, no, she made it to the base camp of Everest trekking and she's, she's telling me what she, I, I'm, I'm not even given the right thing. Bring, 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 bring her on, man. We love, we love having wives and girlfriends on the well, show, man. Come on. Ducking down. I'll, I'll show you a picture of, uh, of the dog we're babysitting and the wife, and then we should probably wrap her up unless you got 
more questions here. Sure. No, I mean, listen, I could, I could do this. I could talk to you for 55 hours, Randy, man. It, it... Let's see if we can get Bergie in there. Oh, hello. What's up? <laughs> and that's Bev. She, she, like, she was instrumental in a lot of the work uh, on the financial side and the uh, uh, throughout the Planet Poker Day. So, you know, everyone asks me the questions, but uh, she, she's got the better stories to tell on the processing side because her background is she's a very smart chartered accountant. Uh, Scott F says this guy needs to be the new face of the Dosecchi's commercials. <laughs> the most interesting man alive. That's what they say, man. John May. Man. Right? Randy's going to be on the next episode of Locked Up Abroad Russia. Okay, I'm I'm keen, but uh, yeah, I, I've got work to do on my golf game as well because I'm like the the other goal is I got to be a single handicap, single digit handicap before I'm. I'm hanging up the, the club. So I got a lot of work to do on the poker game, a lot of work to do on the golf game and trips. I haven't been to Africa on my bike and I haven't done the, the uh, cross Russia component of it yet. So do you, do you, okay. Do you really have to do Russia? Well, not, not necessarily, but uh, it's, it's such a big daunting <laughs> piece of geography that, you know, it looks like that would be something to do, but Africa, uh, lots to do in Africa, but uh, you've got the political issues and the hot spots that, you know, and, until you're ready to go, it's hard to track a spot that uh, would be safe. When, when I went to South America, I stayed out of Venezuela, and that was the only one that I didn't want to um, uh, shoot through, but I haven't done any of Brazil, so I've got, a, I've got lots of South America that I could revisit as well. So if there's any motorcycle guys out there, they can uh, touch base with me and always more fun to have someone to ride with how, so how does this work exactly if you're driving around the country are you sleeping at hotels or are you like like when you went to buenos aires where you like where do, where do you stay i had you like how does that work okay i i uh, i shot down the coast and i played poker all the way to um and spent a little time in vegas before heading to phoenix stayed with a buddy got my bike tuned and then crossed into Mexico and met a, a, a couple that were just going to ride to Mexico. So I rode with them. And then I met a group of guys halfway through Mexico that uh, were all on these KLR 650s. And there was five of them. And they had they were coming off the beach where they'd spent a couple of weeks with all their camping gear. But now it was time to forget about camping because there's hostels all the way through Latin South America. Central and South America is just a hostel haven. So, you know, you, you'd uh, uh, bring a sleeping bag liner, and that was really all you needed, just in case there were bed bugs and shit. But 10 bucks a night was uh, a big spend in the hostel scene. And you're meeting people, and it's, it's uh, you know, it was a more interesting way to travel than just checking into a, a Holiday Inn and turning the TV on for the night, because you're always meeting other people. Um, one of the challenges to go to Buenos Aires is you've got to put your bike on a, on a boat out of Panama to get to Cartagena, Colombia. And that was an interesting part of the trip because they don't have the road system uh, to get from, from Panama to Colombia. So uh, it's a two day boat ride slash vacation sort of trip, but uh, lots of travelers in transit there on a, on a 90 year old uh, it's called the Steel Rat. That was an interesting part of the trip. But, you know, Machu Picchu, the uh, salt flats in Bolivia, there's just real interesting places to ride and see all over South America. And uh, my Spanish isn't very good, so I hitched my wagon to a guy that uh, was fluent. <laughs> Stayed close with him once I met him in Mexico. Wow. So you're just kind of going, meet, meeting people along the way, staying yeah, at hostels. You, you got to get started. You know, it's it's sort of like it's a daunting thing to start online poker, but if you don't take that first step, you never do it. It's the same as a motorcycle trip of that nature. Is if you just don't get out the door and and head down the road, you don't you don't do it. So that's uh, that's part of what makes life interesting, I guess. And I, you know, I might only have another ten years of motorcycling, maybe twenty, <laughs> but. Uh, I think I got another 20 years of poker <laughs> from, from some of the guys I battled with in this town, especially at the Orleans. There's some old time grinders here that are still 
giving it their best shot. It's, it's a wonderful thing to, you know, that you can still do late in life. That's awesome, man. Well, Randy, I appreciate you coming on, man. We'll kind of, we're kind of leave with that wisdom for everybody out there. Everybody in the chat, appreciate all the comments, all the questions. A lot of great comments about you, Randy. People are, uh, people are definitely enjoying your stories. They, they definitely a, a big fan. So I wish we could figure out more of where of, I wish we could like follow along. I wish we had like a blog where some of these travel stories were posted because I'd be very interested in reading those things, man. But well, uh, it's, we should, we should uh, have a beer next time you're in Vegas. Just keep in touch. Let's do that, man. Definitely. I look forward. Keep, I'm going to keep updated, kind of see how you're doing with your uh, 2017 goal, 150 Bitcoin. And uh, I, I think that's probably the last podcast of 2016, man. It's been a, it's been a fucking crazy year, guys. We've had, we've had so many good podcasts this year. Every month, I feel like we've had a bunch of great ones. And I uh, appreciate everyone for uh, always tuning in, all the comments, all the questions. And, and much love, Randy. Take, Thank you for being the last guest, man. Good game is a fast game. <laughs> take care. I'll take care, Randy. I'll see you.